what happens when you cross an Asian dumpling with a European dumpling? You get Russian pilmeni. It's a dish that is so near and dear to my heart. Shaping these cute little bundles was one of my first kitchen tasks. I don't know how old I was. I'm guessing about seven years old. Today, we are going to geek out about pilmeni. I'll show you what happens when you unleash a very food-obsessed person onto her favorite childhood dish and let her borrow freely from other cuisines. I don't think there is any food that has more personality than a dumpling. To me, ravioli are like Audrey Hepburn, elegant, and the soup dumplings are like Marilyn Monroe. Since it's a family-friendly channel, let's call it sensual. So what does that make pilmeni? I haven't decided yet, but after you watch the video, if you can think of an actress, let me know in the comments. You might have noticed that there is no such thing as a juicy ravioli. In Italian cooking, pasta is usually filled with cooked meat or some other filling, which should be soft, but not juicy. I would even argue that more emphasis is placed on the sauce than on what's inside the dough. In Asian cuisines, the filling is usually made out of raw meat, and that's the star of the show. It's supposed to be at least somewhat juicy. How juicy depends on the dish. The most juicy of them all are the soup dumplings. The sauce is definitely subordinate to what's inside the dumpling. It offers seasoning, like salt and acidity, but it doesn't change the mouthfeel of the dish with fatty richness the way Italian sauces do. Well, pilmeni borrow the best parts from both Asia and Europe. The filling is bursting with juice and the outside is beautifully rich. Traditionally, it's just butter or sour cream or both. Good but boring. And I decided to do something about that. You know how Samin Nasrat talks about layering salt? Well, in this dish, I layer butter. I coat my pilmeni in brown butter, which gives them great depth and nuttiness. Then I add some fresh butter to help the sauce emulsify and brighten it with a touch of lemon. It's like French bournoisette and beurre blanc in one glorious dish. I got the brown butter idea from the one and only my favorite Ukrainian food writer, Olya Hercules. You think I'm done with butter? Absolutely not. I also add a little to the filling. It makes the texture a lot softer. My pet peeve with many versions of pilmeni is that the filling can taste like a little lump with the texture of a hot dog. It might be authentic, but to me that's unacceptable. In my pilmeni, I aim for the filling to be very soft, and I'm looking for the juice to be in the meat, not just outside of the meat. I want the meat and broth to become one, instead of a little lump of meat swimming in broth. Okay, my friends, let's get to work. For the dough, I am using my standard egg pasta dough that is modified to have way less eggs and way more water. Pilmeni dough is rolled a little thicker than pasta dough, and thus it needs to be a bit softer. The more water the dough contains, the softer it is, and the more egg the dough contains, the firmer and richer it is. Since my food processor is on the small side, I'll make two batches of dough, and then I'll knead them together by hand. Here is the first batch. Put 300 grams of double zero pasta flour or unbleached all-purpose flour into a food processor. Add two teaspoons of diamond crystal kosher or one teaspoon of table salt and spin for 10 seconds to combine. Then prep your wet ingredients. Weigh out one egg, one yolk, and then add enough water to get 185 grams. Add these wet ingredients to the flour and process until the dough comes together. This will not even take a minute. When you get this little tornado spinning around, you are done. Get it out of the processor with every bit of stuff that's left behind. Make sure to scrape off the blade, the walls, and the flour that gets stuck under the blade. Let's make another batch. 
Okay, so now let's incorporate all the bits of dough and flour that we got out of the processor into each batch and then combine them together. If your food processor is large, there is no need to split the dough into two batches. And if you don't have a food processor at all, check the link in the description below for how to use the well method to bring the wet and dry ingredients together. At first, things will be very wet. But as you keep kneading, the dough should stop sticking. If it still sticks after two minutes of kneading, add more flour. If you haven't made pasta dough before, see the link below this video where I go through it in detail. The ingredients are a little different, but the procedure is the same. Since I'm making a double batch, it took me a bit longer to get it perfectly elastic. A single batch would be around 8 minutes of kneading, but this one I needed for 12. You can't overknead pasta dough, so when in doubt, knead some more. This dough will be a little stickier than Italian pasta dough. After I'm done kneading, here is what it should feel like. If I press into it with a clean and dry finger, it should pull up a little, but then let go and leave my finger clean. The Italian pasta dough wouldn't pull up at all. How much flour it will take will really depend on the humidity in the air. The recipe I gave you is pretty wet, since it's easier to add flour than to add water. If you live in Florida or some other humid place, you might want to reduce the liquid to 175 grams instead of 185 grams right up front. Sprinkle the dough with flour, wrap in plastic, and let it sit at room temperature for at least 30 minutes and up to 5 hours. While our dough is resting, let's work on the filling. I am making a huge batch of filling today because I need some for another application. So if everything on the screen looks twice as much as I am telling you to use in the recipe, that's why. One slightly unusual ingredient in my pilmeni filling is homemade gelatinous stock. Mine is made from chicken, but you can use beef, pork, etc. Most pilmeni recipes simply use water, and that's pretty good. It does give you juiciness, but stock produces not only tasty juice, but also way better texture of the meat because of gelatin. I'll link to all my stock videos below. I have one done in a regular pot and one done in the instant pot. In both of those videos, I reduce the stock for storage. But in this recipe, we don't need to reduce it. If yours is already reduced, reconstitute it back with cold water. If you don't want to make stock, I'll put instructions below this video for how you can cheat by using unflavored gelatin and water to simulate homemade stock. Here are some other juiciness enhancers that we'll need for the filling. One peeled celery stick, one small yellow onion, one garlic clove, and a handful of dill, parsley, or cilantro. Today I have dill and cilantro and two tablespoons of cold, unsalted butter cut into roughly six pieces. Put all the coarsely chopped veggies, butter, and stock into the food processor and process until very finely chopped. See how all my butter got broken up into tiny bits? Dump all this stuff into a large bowl. Add two and a quarter teaspoons of diamond crystal kosher salt or one and an eighth teaspoon of table salt. Just a friendly reminder that diamond crystal kosher is way less salty than Morton's kosher salt. Add some black pepper and finally one pound of ground meat. About the meat. What you use and how it's ground is very important. I use a mixture of beef, pork, and veal. It's sold as a meatloaf mix at most supermarkets. If you can't find it, use half beef, half pork, and buy the fattiest grinds available, ideally 80-20. You want a fine grind, but you don't want it to be like a paste. Mix it all up very thoroughly. You can use a large spoon or your hands, but you need to make sure that the mixture is completely homogeneous and absolutely no lumps of meat remain. To taste for salt, cook about a teaspoon of the filling in a microwave for 15 seconds or just until it's cooked. It will have a lousy texture, but it will give you a chance to evaluate the salt level and 
adjust it if necessary. Line a baking sheet with parchment or foil and sprinkle it generously with flour. For shaping, I switch to all-purpose flour because it's so much cheaper than double zero. Double zero makes a difference in the dough, but for shaping, it's not a big deal. I'll show you two methods for rolling out the dough. We'll do it both by hand and using a pasta roller. Pasta roller is way easy in my opinion. To do it by hand, cut the dough into strips. Keep the remaining dough covered at all times to prevent it from drying out. Roll each dough strip into a log. Tuck in the ends and cut the log crosswise into little pieces. Each piece should be about 10 grams. Set the pieces onto the cut side into the flour and gently press down. Flip them over and press again to coat thoroughly with flour on the other side. You're trying to make little circles. Then roll out each circle with a rolling pin until it's one millimeter thin. Use enough flour so that the dough doesn't stick to the counter or to the rolling pin. And make sure to rotate the dough frequently to get an even circle. This does take a bit of practice, so don't worry if your first few circles are not very circular. <laughs> if you're rolling with a machine, take a piece of dough that's about 100 grams, roll it out to the thickness of a pancake, sprinkle generously with flour, put it through the first setting, then the second, third, etc., until you get to the fifth setting. By the way, making it the full width of the machine as I did here is a mistake. It's too big for one row of circles and too small for two. So shoot for roughly three inches wide. Reflower the dough as necessary so that it doesn't stick and cut it in half crosswise if the ribbon gets too long to make it easier to work with. After you get through the fifth setting the first time, Put it through the fifth setting one more time. This will get it a little thinner, but not quite as thin as the sixth setting. See, this is much better width for a ribbon. Cut with a three inch cookie cutter into circles. Don't discard the scraps. You can collect them, smoosh them together and re-roll them. Sprinkle your working surface with flour and place the circles on top. You want a floury underneath and no flour on top to help you seal the dumplings. If you see any flour on top, brush it off with a pastry brush. Put a heaping teaspoon of filling into the center of each circle. Connect the edges together and seal them well. No need to brush the dough with water. This dough seals perfectly all by itself. I like to go through the edges one more time, rubbing them gently to make them a little roughly. It's not only pretty, but ensures that the dumpling is completely sealed. Connect the two ends together, making them overlap and press. Place all the dumplings onto a prepared baking sheet and refrigerate until ready to use. A few practical considerations. As you can imagine, this is a time-consuming dish, so I wanted to give you a few planning tips. The dough needs to be filled within a few minutes after it's rolled out, otherwise your circles will dry out. Try to recruit someone in the family to help you. This way one person is rolling and cutting the circles, while the other one is filling them. If you are working alone, roll 8 to 10 circles, Fill them and only then roll more. Now a little tip about the meat. You don't want to keep all this ground meat out at room temperature for hours. So I suggest you put some into a small bowl and work with that and keep the rest in the fridge. Once you use it up, get a clean small bowl and clean utensils and get yourself more filling. Also don't keep the finished dumplings at room temperature longer than 45 minutes. Put whatever you already made after 45 minutes into the the fridge while working on the rest. Unless you're getting your dining companions involved in shaping, you'll probably want to do all the shaping ahead of time. You have a few options for storing pelmeni. If you plan to serve them within four hours, cover them with plastic and put them in the fridge. If you are planning to serve them later, you can freeze them. Put the baking sheet in the freezer just until they are hard, about three hours. Then move them into a freezer bag. If you forget to move them to the bag, they'll dehydrate and the dough will crack. So set a timer and don't forget. They can be stored in the freezer for a few months, but 
are best if eaten within a couple of weeks. If you freeze them, don't defrost. Boil them right from the frozen state. Okay, we are on the finish line. Let's cook them and sauce them. Bring a big pot of water to a boil. Mine is little because I'm only cooking one portion for now. Set a stainless steel pot over medium heat and add one tablespoon of butter for every 10 pelmeni. 10 would be a reasonable portion. Though we Russians kind of dispense with reason when it comes to pelmeni, I can easily eat 20. That's why I don't make them that often. <laughs> but right now I plan to cook about 10. If the butter gets very sputtery, turn down the heat. Cook it swirling the pan occasionally until you see many dark brown specks. When the butter is this color, take it off heat. Once the butter cools off a bit, add the squirt of lemon. The reason I waited is to avoid the butter sputtering in my face. Salt the boiling water generously and add the pelmeni. Stir to make sure they don't stick to the bottom. If the water stops boiling, cover it just until you get the boil back. Set the timer for 3 minutes if starting from fresh pelmeni and 6 minutes if starting from frozen. When the timer goes off, fish one out and cut it in half to see if the meat is cooked and if the dough is done to your liking. I like my dough a little chewy. Fish out your pelmeni with a slotted spoon. This spider is absolutely amazing. I only got it a year ago and I don't know how I lived without it. It holds a ton and drains as fast as possible. Put pelmeni into the brown butter. Add a teaspoon of fresh butter for each serving of 10 and a little sprinkle of dill. Toss it all to combine and wait 5 minutes before digging in. You don't want the hot juice to scold you. Oh my oh my! I know I told you I could easily eat 20 of these, but I think I was underestimating. This is a dangerous dish. I wish I could put a camera in my mouth, but since Canon is still working on it, I'll have to cut one and a half for you to see what's inside. You see how soft the filling is? And the juice is not just around the meat, it's in the meat. I can never decide if I like them with just butter or with sour cream. I don't believe sour cream is a good replacement for butter, but I think it's a good addition to the butter. So I usually eat half of my bowl with butter only and then add the sour cream. Oh, sour cream with brown butter? Someone should patent this. It's wicked awesome! I hope you find some partners in crime who will help you shape and eat pelmeni. And if you think of an actress who embodies the spirit of this dish, let me know. Here are some more in-depth culinary tutorials for you to check out. And if you are ever in the Boston area, maybe I'll see you in one of my classes.